In this presentation, um, I'd like to focus on what I think is an entanglement of productive activities within play spaces, virtual play spaces, that is, connected to or even enabled by photographic media. The context of this research is a phenomenon that has been labeled in-game photography. <clears throat> so, in-game photography is sort of an umbrella term that has become um, you know, like a container for many different practices and technologies, including art modes, screenshotting, photo modes, photographing screen, and others. But it's usually referred to as the act of capturing, producing, and sharing images from within computer game environments. In my argumentation, I'll try to first trace a brief historical contextualization of this phenomenon, addressing the intersection of photographic and play practices, <coughs> and how this could be seen through the lens of both play theory and theories of immaterial labor. Analyzing the development of in-game photography until now, I'll focus on the ways the space for photographic play has changed from a free transformative play to a restricted space brought back to be confined within the walls built by game developers. To become an integral part of the infrastructure and algorithms that regulate the so-called attention economy of networked images and their metrics. And, I mean, full disclosure, uh, of course, this goes for everything that I say here. Um, I am aware that there are a lot of um, different aspects, effective aspects in this um, production and sharing of images, but I'm really focusing on the relationship between play and how um, capital or labor activities are connected to it. So, um, if I don't mention this, it's not because I'm, I'm not aware of them, but in in this particular context, I'm, I'm focusing more on, on this other side. Um, finally, I'll attempt to give a definition of this form of productive play that I called photographic labor, and to situate it within discourses of immaterial labor connected to network image circulation and virtual play. In doing this, I'll rely on discourses both, discourses both from media studies as well as game studies, trying to bridge the role of media in the context of labor with the practices of play that intersects with activities of leisure and production, and how the boundaries between these are blurred. So, photographing game screen is a practice that dates to the pre network world of arcade parlors and early consoles of the 1980s. Typically, players would submit photographic evidence of their high scores through Polaroids. Um, it's also interesting to see like, uh, that these this photographs are very rare because uh, the companies would actually get these images to uh, validate the scores and, and keep track of, of players um, did not keep any records. As David Crane, co-founder of Activision, reported, as far as, I know, quote, this, as far as I know, none of these were saved for much more than a few weeks, certainly not 35 years. Photographic evidence definitely existed at one time, but it has most certainly been lost for decades. And this is, in fact, a screenshot from a movie that reenacted this, this, uh, this practice of the 80s. Hing in photography's roots might, however, be more fitting in the context of the 90s. These are the years of um, cultural and artistic enthusiasm for appropriating and modifying computational technologies thanks to access, knowledge, and sharing possibilities offered and facilitated by the Internet. Movement like net art, and specifically in the context of computer games, the birth and rise of modding culture and machinima of the same era, are the neighbors and comrades of in-game photography's origins, in my view. The communities that have emerged around photographing practices in game shared an artistic approach and a creative spirit of appropriation of game images which differ substantially from the idea of employing photography as a mere proof. Um, taking pictures of game world started as a practice of sharing memorable, bizarre, funny moments and later with the addition of um, photorealism focused more on aesthetical qualities of the images, screenshots of landscape, um, portraits, um, character portraits, images that reminds us of the lineage of architecture photography, street photography. <clears throat> its community of player photographers discusses techniques and compositions on online forum, 
share tips for getting the best shots and argue about photographic definitions and genres. And from a technical perspective, the print screen button replaces the camera shutter um, in this, in this uh, early phase. And these images are maybe better understood somewhere between, re somewhere between remediation and simulations of photography rather than actual photographs. And I'm being very vague here because I don't want to open this up. Um, because, um, well, as I mentioned early, there's, they are very uh, technique independent, all of this. Uh, there are many diverse ways of taking um, pictures in games. And even if we are looking just at screenshots, um, one can think of the many layers of mediation that are contained with uh, um, you know, screenshotting, a photorealistic CGI. It gets, um, yeah, it's kind of for another talk. So, in 2002, Betty, Betsy Books compared screenshotting practices um, of this era within games to tourists snapping pictures offline. And in Cindy Poremba's seminal essay, Point and Shoot, um, Books' virtual tourism idea is summarized and explained like this. Quote, virtual tourists take photos for the same reasons offline tourists do to commemorate their travels, obtain a visual record of enjoyable experiences, and show evidence of their experiences to friends and family. From the perspective of play, however, what looks like a simple touristic endeavor is actually an act of negotiation within the rigid rules of games, and the refusal to commit to the path laid out by the game designers and developers. In 2002, Katie Salen wrote, Play, quote, players began to play the Sims in very unusual ways, in order to compose exact shots they wanted. Strategies for successful gameplay, such as keeping game characters happy, were superseded by strategies for positioning objects and characters in a scene. In 2007, um, Selen um, coined the term transformative play. And defined it as a, as a Quote again, a special case of play that occurs when the free movement of play alters the more rigid structure in which it takes shape. The play doesn't just occupy and oppose the interstices of the system, but actually transforms the space as a whole. Unquote. Maybe it's also um, interesting to think of other ideas around these notions of um, playing in a sort of transgressive way. And Daniel Reynolds wrote of virtual world naturalism being, I'll just read it, can I just say, I'll read an excerpt, and I don't want to do the quote unquote thing, I'm sorry. At once, a return to an investigative urge that has been subsumed to the exhaustive mapping and description of the real world, and a form of resistance to the very idea of predefined paths of action of externally imposed limits in virtual world as well as in our own. So this idea of resistance um, to the idea of a predefined path of action is key here. And somehow um, resonates also with this notion of the gameplay condition by Oli Leno. Um, so transgressing this condition, this gameplay condition, he uh, defines it as in the following excerpt, a duality of freedom and responsibility. The game gives the player freedom of choice while simultaneously making her responsible for this freedom by resisting her project of playing. So in short, um, screenshotting practices within game spaces can be better understood as playing against or with the game, but not or in opposition as playing the game. So just to give an example, um, or, or going back to the example of the scenes that was made by Salen, um, in order to take a photo, a screenshot of the game, you have to stop playing, endangering your character, maybe you know, risking that your character will be killed, or in other games to, you know, to, to lose the game. So this, this, um, um, this is the basis of photography as a, as a form of transformative play in games. At the same time, these practices of creative appropriation are not detached from logics of production and are entangled with, labors, with uh, uh, labor processes tightly connected to the game industry and capitalism more generally. Uh, we've seen this morning already the mention of uh, Tiziana Terranova's um, free labor theory, which she built on autonomous uh, 
theory to highlight the prevalence of uh, free labor offense and users generating content for free in digitally based cultural industries. And that includes, of course, virtual play. In 2000, instead of quote, this is more like a karaoke thing. I don't have the quotes, I have like <laughs> words. Um, Julian Kuklik in 2005 coined the term playbor, a uh, portmanteau of play and labor, two terms which were traditionally defined in a way that makes them mutually exclusive. And Kuklik specifically talks of modding, which is the practice of user modifying game and creating new game out of them, um, which was particularly um, popular and, and becoming a phenomenon in the 90s, as I mentioned before. And so uh, modding becomes the paradigmatic example of how play and labor are imploded in a way that is generally rewarding to capitalists who retain property rights to all modifications that users make to games and thus the exclusive right to profit off of them. And on top of this um, phenomenon of, of modding, there's three more other examples that are offered by uh, Greg Depoter and Nick dyer Witherford also related to um, computer games. Microdevelopment, multi, massively multiplayer online games, and machinima. I don't think I have time to go into details, uh, but maybe we can leave that for the discussion if you're interested. I think the most important one um, in connection to in-game photography is machinima as it um, somehow has to do with uh, a medium that is very close to photography. Machinima is um, the practice of uh, appropriating in-game footage to then re-edit it and often add in subtitles and a narrative making it um, a different sort of uh, artistic form. And uh, one of the famous examples of, of this um, appropriation by the industry is Microsoft uh, um, appropriating the famous red and blue, red versus blue machinima series um, was, that was made in uh, Quake. Okay, so <clears throat> I think this case has perfectly exemplified the tensions that underline material labor and computer play. Tensions between play and labor, creative processes and capital capture social exchange and commercial value, fans and industry, players and corporations, and so on. So, but I think what's in interesting, and also maybe that was my question to Olga this morning, I'm, I'm having trouble getting, um, understanding maybe how this clash somehow is structured. And I think it's, it's um, very helpful not to think of a, division or a clash that is just between the utopian and subversive counterculture of programmers, hackers and players versus the military industrial complex, um, but rather a, pro a process of uh, like a, a game of um, cat and mouse, you know, like, or rope, um, between disruptive forces that are later assimilated into business models and profit-oriented structures. Actually, if we follow um, the putters and Dyer Witherford, they propose that this disruption is exactly instrumental um, to the industry and to the um, need of capital uh, to then recapture, also to get this creativity from um, somewhere. And it's from this, uh, um, these pockets of resistance and transgressions that we find in, in these cases, for example. And I think that in-game photography is um, to be situated within this, this frame. Um, <clears throat> another example that maybe is uh, something that uh, we must uh, say if we're talking about games is Space War because uh, Space War was one of the first computer games developed in 1961 by Steve Russell, circulated via ARPANET, funded by military funds in a research lab, but uh, at the same time being um, this very creative, disruptive thing that became what now we call a computer game. Um, and so Space War is simultaneously the first disruptive creation of moonlighting programmers of the counter-computer culture. So they were developing this in their extra hours um, outside of the, well, within their lab outside of the working hours. Also an early instance of participatory design 
freeware and open source development. At the same time, it's the first product of immaterial labor that would be reintegrated by the industry in the form of computer game as a, as a commodity, as, as we know them now. So I think somehow, and I know this is a bit loose, but this idea of a feedback loop um, where even commodity forms, games depends on the immaterial labor of transformative play and hacking on this, this uh, playboard force. It's just three, three segments, don't, don't worry. So, <clears throat> in the discourses of immaterial labor within computer games, players producing screenshots of games are not mentioned as an emergent form of playboard force. So only this, this other four um, phenomenon were um, somehow cited so far. In some respect, this phenomenon initially remains a marginal practice and, and a much less critical to compare to those of modding and machinima. And its community, as well as the economic potential um, seen by the industry, only explodes later. So it's 2012, for example, when game journalist uh, Rainer Siegel ad, um, addresses these practices in his blog, Video Game Tourism, under the label In-Game Photography, and with the title The Art of In-Game Photography, a term that sprang up from players and picking up popularity online, or at least to my knowledge at this stage of my research without a clear origin, most certainly not imposed from above. And this shift, uh, um, within the practices of in-game photography and this interest of the industry um, for this phenomenon can be observed from the industry point of view in two moments for me. So the first is the stark contrast in the policies allowing screen captures by game consoles like, J like a PlayStation by Sony. So PlayStation 3, for example, made things very difficult for players to get images out. Um, you had to get dongles and unofficial external devices to get to capture um, screenshots and, and images created by third-party manufacturers and so. Whereas in 2013, PlayStation 4 comes out with a built-in function on a hardware and software level that not only creates but encourages the sharing of screenshots and screen grabs taken in game. The second moment that makes apparent this shift, this moment where companies turn their attention towards the photographic production of player, is a special event organized for the release of NVIDIA Ansel, which is an engine for advanced in-game content capture. So NVIDIA CEO takes the stage in Austin in 2016, celebrating in-game photography as an art form. There's a big projection with images and names of in-game photographers. Duncan Harris, Joshua Taylor, Leonardo Sang, and James Pollock. All popular figures uh, among forums online and definitely not celebrated as artists by conventional art institutions, who became popular within online communities for their pictures. And in big white letters above the images, above the images, a text reads the art of in-game photography. <coughs> So NVIDIA seals the recognition of in-game photography as an art form and attempts to canonize it and stabilize it as a defined practice, already with a number of artists who validate this movement and set already the themes, the standards, and the genre. NVIDIA is a graphic card company. So it produces graphic cards for um, our computer and consoles, and then game consoles. It builds GPUs. <coughs> and yet here acts like an art critic or a cultural institution, developing new software to support the growing community of players who take screenshots in games. NVIDIA's business model is obviously closely connected to the development of computer games graphics in an industry that has been obsessing with advancement of real-life simulation in AAA games. Uh, AAA is it's like a blockbuster um, the equivalent like, of a blockbuster Hollywood movie. <clears throat> so the conceit of sharper verisimilitude and higher resolutions is a major theme in commercial visual media, and in games this resulted in the strive for photorealism. Friedrich Tietjen quotes the founder of Epic Games and uh, of the game engine Unreal, Tim Sweeney, who in 2017 declared that games will be absolutely photorealistic within the next 10 years. 
and with an indistinguishable from reality level of graphics. So Tietjen argues that the notion of photorealism is a blurry one and, quote, the photo, I'll give it a try again. The photorealistic image could appear like a photograph or it, could, it can appear like reality itself. And there is some evidence that Sweeney had the latter definition in mind, unquote. The development of photorealism in the game industry inherits the blind spots of a certain uncritical understanding of photography, considered as a neutral tool of representation of reality. Photorealism also allows the semiotic and language of photographic media to be simulated and applied to CGI. This means that we are able to recognize and read images and their embedded symbols in games, just like we have been trained to do from the visual media of photography, cinema, and television. Um, so, you know, a car looks like a car, the calm tranquility of a sunset postcard, um, the ideology be behind the fast red car, and even the self-affirmation of the selfie picture can be carried onto images uh, um, taken within games. <coughs> Let's give an example, for example. In other words, we are conditioned and programmed visually by in-game photographs, just like we are in the form of traditional cinematic and photographic spectatorship. So reproducing this um, dominant capitalist uh, ideologies that uh, we are um, already familiar from um, advertisement, cinema, and photography. So I believe this is one reason why the potential of these images and the labor force behind them only became apparent with photorealism. No screenshot of Tetris, Pong, Space War were ever considered um, in, as image capital for the attention economy. Although that would be great. Um, <clears throat> So photographs somehow needed to be part of this visual regime, in-game photographs that is, in order to impose this narrative and align you know, with the logic of a society of the spectacle. Um, and if car racing games and first person shooters and soccer simulation games, these triple I games, these blockbuster games that target what is known in the industry of, as the hardcore, um, which is basically white middle class male players, so if these games produce the subject they advertise for, what kind of images can come out of photographic play? What are the possible narratives that can be created by extracting images and replacing play with aesthetics in this context? And um, yeah, let's do this. <clears throat> So in October 2014, Matteo Bitanti conducted a month-long analysis of in-game photos posted on an online thread on the forum NeoGAF titled Forza Horizon 2 Photo Thread, You Don't Take a Photograph, You Make It. And he looked at almost 2,000 um, images in one month shared on the thread, all taken in the racing game. Which is, uh, so this one is from that thread, actually. And <clears throat> Within these images, 40.7%, around 760 images, depicted car brands. 34% were selfies of the player's avatar in the car. 15% were postcard like pictures, and so on. And um, yeah, very few glitches, which is maybe something that kind of takes us back to this idea of, of proof of the beginning. So also this, this shift from the initial um, version of in-game photography. So, this is what I would like to claim as, I mean, as one of the factors that made in-game photography um, part of this, this uh, logic of photographic uh, um, labor. The second factor that I believe was a decisive one for in-game photography to gain global popularity and to simultaneously become enmeshed in the logic of co-optation and capture of immaterial labor is the rise of social media platforms in post-Web 2.0 and the ideas of so-called attention economy built around the metrics of the current dom currently dominating network structures of exchange of uh, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the likes. Um, so text and images circulating over global networks start to be confined to corporate sites, their exchange quantified by metrics, uh, tracking attention in form of likes, thumbs up, retweets, followers, and creating a currency to measure what uh, advertiser called the harvesting of eyeballs, where photographic media play, uh, of course, a central role. Uh, so I'm referring to Jody Dean's idea of uh, communicative capitalism to define this 
the shift of the system of volume of network exchanges. Um, a shift from message to contribution and from use value to exchange value. So she claims that, quote, communicative exchanges are the basic elements of capitalist production. Unquote. Actually, this is important, so I left it there. I'm not sure if it's better if I, I read it while you read it. Yes. The exchange value of messages overtakes their use value. So a message is no longer primarily a message from a sender to a receiver. Uncoupled from context of action and application, as on the web or in print and broadcast media, the message is simply part of a circulating data stream. Its particular content is irrelevant. Who sent it is irrelevant. Who receives it is irrelevant. That it needs to be responded to is irrelevant. The only thing that is relevant is circulation, the addition to the pool. Circulation is the context, the condition for the acceptance or rejection of a contribution. Put somewhere differently, how a contribution circulates determines whether it had been accepted or rejected. The popularity, the penetration and duration of contribution marks its acceptance or success. And of course, um, together with this, the ideas of computational capital by Jonathan Beller um, help us understand this idea of a colonization of all subjects of life by digitization, computation, and, and the mathematics that provide the quantification of our social connection and eventually turning us into worker. Now I'll pause, I'll check. Okay. Jonathan Beller didn't have anything bad to say about this. So I might have gotten right. Okay, now these two features, photorealism and circulation, somehow, and this may be my own kind of personal wonder, but they appear a bit antithetical somehow, um, in the sense that if we just look at the addition to the pool as, um, you know, messages as, as numbers of, of contribution rather than um, their content, then isn't there like some sort of uh, contrast with the, the idea of photorealism being able to represent? So if representation um, is then the content of the image is useless, why is photorealism so important? But I think actually it's, it's uh, um, they're kind of complementary in a certain way. So they affect very, two very different things, although I think within the global logic of, of uh, capital they're related. So maybe we could be seen as two different layers of capital production. From a representational point of view, they program the viewer remediating photographic and cinematic language, reinforcing and optimizing narratives of media imperialism, and producing advertisement images with free labor. On the level of circulation, their content becomes irrelevant, but they become commodities and their exchange values is quantified by metric of attention. Last uh, <coughs> So. Photo modes. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, these games, um, recently photo <coughs> modes um, started being integrated inside uh, many of these games. So photo modes are a function that is part of the game. It started appearing already in 2004 but became most popular after the game The Last of Us was remastered for the newly launched PlayStation 4 in 2013. Photo modes allow players to pause gameplay in order to save an image of a moment within the game world. Unlike a normal screenshot, players are able to navigate this frozen scene. They can position the virtual camera anywhere, move freely around their subjects at 360 degrees to find the perfect framing before taking the pictures. So just take two, four different uh, screenshots within a photo mode and you can see all these different parameters and um, <coughs> control options that you have within the software. So while photo modes do suspend the gameplay, just like in the suspension of the gameplay condition of transformative play, the photographic act is now confined within the walls of the game program designed by the game developer. The transformative play of the 90s screenshot and practices is now embedded in the paths allowed by the game, minimizing the transgression of the gameplay condition. 
If screenshotting required setting up the scene and catch the shot while the game was running, photo modes freeze the game and allow players to spend as much time as they want without any consequences on the gameplay once they decide to end their photographic activities. Photographic play as transformative play endangered the gameplay condition. Photographing a scene meant consciously allowing the game to progress while stopping to play it, risking the game to end or to go in unwanted directions. And I was in a talk in, in uh, Paris a couple of weeks ago and uh, Thibault Brunet, who is an artist who is working in, in game photography, was talking about um, doing some of his images in game in this like, first person shooter environment. And he was saying like how some, in some games like he, has, he had to ask his friend to come and, and um, shoot at the enemy so that he could like take the pictures um, unkilled. Um, so this is a very maybe good contrast to you know like this idea of uh, transformative playing game. We actually have to really fight against the game in order to to, to engage in photographic play. And now um, photo modes actually takes all of that away and we bring you inside the, the, the walls of the developed game, the design path. Furthermore, on top of controlling the game camera, photo modes allow players to simulate the interface of analog cameras by providing parameters to adjust the image, such as field of view, depth of field zooming, adding color filters, and even simulating the grain of analog film. Many of these effects are similar to the filters that appeared on smartphone camera apps, often providing the nostalgic look of film photography. On PlayStation 4, photo modes are coupled with a button that was added to the game controller. It's called the share button. Once photo mode is activated and the player has adjusted the settings to her liking, pressing the built-in share button on the controller takes the picture. By default, every time <coughs> every image taken by the player can be automatically shared online. The act of capture and sharing are now merged into a new unity. So we could say that taking a picture is now replaced by sharing a picture. This is the official video from Sony PlayStation introducing the new function of the share button. This is for the players. And also, um, this is also reinforced on the narratives and rhetorics um, of every official video explaining how photo modes uh, work. So this sharing instead of taking a picture is, uh, is now kind of um, this, this switch also on, on the language um, in many of these uh, videos. This is a quick edit I made of a couple of official um, Tutorials of photo modes of some. Oh, not yet. Enter photo mode, set up your shot, and share it with the share button. When you're ready to take a screenshot, hide the UI using the triangle button, and then hit the share button to share your photo. Once you've framed up your shot, just press the share button to save the image and upload for your friends to check out. This UI shows you all the photo mode controls, including the button to hide the controls. We're really excited about this new way you can share your experience with The Last of Us Remastered for PlayStation 4. Alright, okay, so you set up the virtual Pulitzer Prize winning photo, now what? Easy. Hit triangle to hide the UI. It's a toggle, so do it again and turn it back on. And use the share button to publish your photo. It's called photo mode. This new mode allows you to freeze the action in the game, adjust the camera, and add custom effects and frames before sharing them with the share button on the DualShock 4. The share button. So on the level of representation, photo modes encourage a nostalgic notion of analog photography with all these parameters and all these um, um, effects that you can add. 
while on the hidden level of software, photo modes and share buttons create a specific um, infras or are part of a specific infrastructure structurally connected to the ecosystem of network images and algorithm that add to the pool of Dean's com communicative capitalism. This disguise as a nostalgic photography from a simpler past. I'm thinking of um, Domenico Quaranta wrote of, of digital photography being the body's nature of photography and something that um, comes back in this idea of like trying to disguise yourself as a simpler version of photography somehow, um, is in complete opposition to the properties of networked and algorithmic photography that photo modes incorporate. Furthermore, players photographers become quite literally the functionaries of the camera program of Flusser that we also heard about before. The photographic labor force encouraged to add images to the pool of communicative exchanges. Um, okay, so just to recap, basically, my idea is that um, through the years we have seen, and especially with this introduction of photo modes and share buttons, uh, the creation of a dedicated space that not only encourages free digital labor in the form of photographic play, but it really structures it um, in connections to this whole um, infrastructure that is connected to, to I mean, not only photographic, but definitely um, media-based uh, attention economy platforms. Now, my presentation originally ended here with the conclusion <laughs> that photographic play has been diverted from its free and transformative disruptive force and channeled into a restrictive, restricted space where players are left only with limited controls over aesthetic choices and ultimately tasked with adding their images to social media platforms of the attention economy. But this somehow sounded a little bit depressive. So, and being in a photography museum, you know, and as I was trying to think of what possibilities could there be to disrupt the rigid structure of photographic playbook in this form, uh, the internet did something uh, beautiful and unexpected in the way that the internet uh, can do when you're like Google searching through psychogeographic <laughs> styles. Um, and it took me to a video. I'm just going to show you the first two minutes. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's like a 30 minute um, presentation of a developer, but it's, a, oh, it's an introduction of a special feature of a Final Fantasy 17, I don't remember. Okay, and the real, real, real ending, just a, a short quote by the developer who created this feature. No, no, because this takes a to watch the clips, 
and it takes forth to take a good screenshot. However, we plot the snapshot, you know, it's all auto. So, well, just to share or not to share, that's the only question we have left. <laughs> Thank you.